uh, are treating before severe neurologic disease, the IQ or DQ had to be above 70, and that's sort of critical for all these uh, treatments in the brain diseases that we start early. And the same data that Mark showed, they had a remarkable increase in over long term, several up to eight years long term plasma enzyme, and they also, we did, neither of us showed that they decreased the CSF gag storage dramatically. We have, for MPS2, we have active um, for several years moving to a phase three, um, uh, a CNS administration, it's either intraventricular or um, by cisterna magna, which is a small area just below the skull, that's the uh, optimum site, and then we'll move to the ventricle. And I won't go through results, they, um, the industry sponsors will describe these outcomes. This is emphasizes treating early has better outcome. It was the first of the sibling comparisons. That's probably our most useful data to support this, but MPS6 had coming out of the phase three trial a, SIBs in Australia with one just born and one three years old, and you can see it three years later, the, the one, that, the patient, the boy on the left, has a much more normal appearance. His spine is straight. He uh, has uh, a different level of joint disease. Still has dysostosis multiplex, so the bones are not cured, but it's certainly a, a different outcome. Thanking sort of the MPS uh, society and uh, all of the, the main group that, that led through, and I'm sure I've left a lot of people off of that committee that helped push MPS2 through. In California, it'll still take two years to get active um, screening uh, validated and up and running, so it's not an immediate benefit, but it gets us much closer to, to being able to find these patients. And then finish with just mentioning again, Tippy McKinsey is a fetal surgeon. She's interested in immunologic responses in utero. She has a phase one um, trial of a of stem cell transplant for alpha thalassemia hematologic disease and she has a, a phase one for enzyme replacement therapies. She'd like to move, she sees the future once there are approved gene therapies, potentially moving that in utero also. She, Ultragenics partnered with her to uh, look at MPS7 mouse model and um, administer enzyme <clears throat> in utero during, um, while the, the, the fetuses were uh, uh, in gestation, and they uh, then did uh, testing and examination after delivery, and they showed improved survival. The organs had less, much less storage, bone length was better, um, tolerance was induced, as Mark said, and they were able to show enzyme in the brain. Um, uh, this is the tolerance data. This would be sort of the optimum outcome that we could really, would really hope for with MPS. And you can see that um, the bar on the right with all of the points at the bottom were the uh, response to a, a strong challenge in, in um, uh, the fetus is exposed to enzyme. So we, we have this trial. Um, uh, its objectives really are safety, feasibility, uh, everybody was quite nervous. We're giving enzyme scaled down to the weight of the fetus, but it's still a, a dramatically different route. And um, could we weren't really um, sure what the effects in this phase one trial. So um, there has been one patient. It's the, it was a patient with a fetus with Pompe disease, and you can see. Um, Jennifer Cohen presented this at World. She'll do an update at the SSIEM. But this patient, around week 24, was started. The mother was started on, um, pregnant mother with 
was started on enzyme every two weeks. Um, it was the trial was done in Ottawa. It was during COVID. We couldn't bring the family to Oakland um, on an every two week basis or relocate them. So we set up the trial quickly and in Ottawa had a tremendous collaboration with with Sanofi. They were able to provide the assays for antibody. Um, and the drug, six doses were given, term delivery, and the patient's now 11 months old. And the remarkable, um, one, it was safe. I mean, this, we were, we had comments back that this would be incredibly um, uh, detrimental to a, a family, to a, to a, a um, infantile crim negative, um, uh, fetus and um, uh, but the the family was very anxious to move ahead they had had a previous child who was picked up at six months went through immune tolerance and uh, enzyme and survived to 18 months they had a second um, uh, also affected uh, infant that they did not treat um, and then this was the third, and they were willing to, to try something uh, very um, advanced. And so the baby, with Pompeii, you have severe muscle disease. This baby was born with normal CK levels. They've remained normal. Uh, they had uh, a normal heart at birth, which was very unusual, even for patients picked up by newborn screening. Uh, the placenta was cleared of glycogen, of storage deposits, and um, a low level of antibody developed in utero. The patient went through tolerance induction or mod, uh, uh, modulation right after delivery and is doing well with normal uh, strength um, and motor functions over a first year. So um, we're hoping that this can be extended to these other lysosomal storage diseases have similar benefits. It would be pretty um, dramatic help. So that's that's the future, um, although the future is here, and we hope that people will consider this um, as an option if, if with future pregnancies and with severe disease. So just finishing again, thanking everybody for their support. We couldn't do these trials without patients willing to participate, and, and the science can be um, Wonder, wonderful, but if uh, um, we can't have patients coming to, to participate, we won't move forward. Um, that picture, the center person was John Hopwood. John came during a phase three trial in Oakland, gave a lecture to the um, families. Uh, Patricia was on that picture. Her older brother, Harold, was on the picture, and he described how he developed the enzyme, how it went through um, clinical trials, that it, how it's made in the Chinese hamster ovary uh, cell line, um, all of that, and and it's a it's sort of wondrous to watch the families learn about their disease, but also to see the type of impact it can have on someone like John Hopwood, who spent his whole life trying to get this therapy. Um, to the patients, so thank you. We probably used up all of our time, Mark. <laughs> so we are going to um, get us back on schedule um, and, and I will introduce our next speaker. I want to encourage everyone, if you do have questions, um, I'm sure that uh, our speakers would uh, be happy to speak to you uh, th throughout uh, their time here. So feel free to, uh, to stop them and uh, ask away. All right, our next speaker, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Barbara Burton. Dr. Burton is a professor of pediatrics at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine, and director of the MPS ML treatment program in the Division of Genetics, Birth Defects, and Metabolism 
at the Children's Hospital of Chicago. She's a board certified in pediatrics, clinical genetics, and clinical biochemical genetics. And she's currently an investigator for the clinical trials in MPS2, sponsored by Takeda, Denali, and JCR Pharmaceuticals. She is a member of our scientific advisory board here at the National MPS Society, so we really appreciate her volunteer time in that aspect. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Burton. We'll get our presentation here. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. And while my slides are coming up, I'd really like to thank Terry and all of the members of the National MPS Society for inviting me to be here today. It's always such an incredible pleasure coming to these meetings, it's so inspiring, getting the opportunity to talk with patients from all around the country, see colleagues, and, and so thank you so much for that. Uh, it, it really is a pleasure for me. And it's also a pleasure to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is newborn screening, something that's already been mentioned many times today, uh, and we're gonna talk about it in a little bit more detail, specifically as it relates to the MPS disorders. Here are my disclosures. Uh, and for those of you who may not be terribly familiar with how newborn screening works, before we talk about its use in the MPS disorders, I just wanna back up for a minute and um, just talk a little bit about how newborn screening works in the U.S in general. Um, are we good? Okay, good. All right, so I just wanted to familiarize you a little bit with how it works in general. Um, newborn screening is controlled by state health departments, so uh, it's not the same in every state. It, it's a health department initiative, and many times doctors and patients will refer to it as the PKU test because phenylketonuria or PKU was the first disorder for which we had newborn screening, but as you've heard, as we've talked about the RUSP earlier today, there's now in every state at least 35 to 40 different disorders that are detected by newborn screening, not just the ones on the RUSP. There are some secondary disorders that come along with the WASH, and more are being added all the time. But it does vary considerably from state to state, and of course we know it also varies tremendously across the globe because newborn screening you know, it's predominantly something that happens in the developed world, even in, uh, even in Europe, it differs quite a bit from what we do in the United States, and of course, patients in the underdeveloped countries often don't have access to newborn screening uh, for any of the disorders. I seem to be following in Mark's footsteps, having technical issues here. I'm not uh, moving it with the, the buttons on the computer. Let me see if, no, nothing's working. Okay, oops. All right, so I mentioned that it, it's controlled by state health departments. Each, dis, each state has a mechanism for figuring out which disorders they're going to include. It differs a little from state to state. Often there's a, an advisory committee which includes professionals and consumers as well. They decide which disorders they're gonna screen for, how they're gonna screen for it, and really how the, how the program itself is gonna be constructed. But fortunately, back now almost two decades ago, the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders in Infants and Children came into being on the federal level to make recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services regarding which disorders really should be included in newborn screening. And those are the disorders that we say are on the recommended uniform screening panel, or RUSP. So when a disorder is added to the RUSP by the, these federal recommendations, many times states fall into line eventually and include those disorders, but it is only a recommendation. States are not required 
to screen for the conditions on the RUSP, and they certainly can, can, can screen babies for conditions that aren't on the RUSP, and many certainly do. But having the RUSP has definitely improved the uniformity and the equity that we see from state to state. I think the disparities were much greater if we go back to the time before this came into being from state to state uh, than they are now. But nonetheless, still we have uh, considerable variability. Uh, and there are now 36 disorders on the RUSP because you heard that there were 35 going into this week and then within the last two days, MPS2 was added to the RUSP. It had been recommended earlier in the year by the committee, but we were waiting for the Secretary of Health and Human Services to formally accept that recommendation, and that's what's happened within the last two days. So as you've heard, this is just a tremendous victory for the National MPS Society. It's also just an incredible development that that means that moving forward, our kids with MPS2 have so much better a shot at, at having a, a good and healthy life. I think it really is going to make a tremendous difference uh, in the long run in how these kids do. I can tell you that I've had the opportunity to see it already for myself because we've had newborn screening in Illinois since December of 2017. I have seven babies in my practice who were identified by virtue of newborn screening. We've detected eight, seven are at our center, and I know seeing what I see in them that their life is gonna be different, and, and it warms my heart. Um, and of course, there is an established mechanism for nominating new disorders, and we have some others to, to work on. Uh, and there are other uh, disease groups, of course, also who want the same thing. Uh, we have other treatable metabolic disorders out there where newborn screening could make a significant difference in outcome. Uh, those are important too, and fortunately some of those are being added. There's another one, GAMT deficiency, that has been recommended by the committee to be added to the RUSP, waiting for the Secretary's decision on that one. So hopefully, by the end of this calendar year, perhaps, we will really have 37 disorders on the list. So, so what do we look at in deciding whether a disorder is a good candidate for newborn screening? Well, of course, the disorder needs to be one that's serious, um, and there has to be a test that you can do on that dried blood spot, that filter paper sample that's used for newborn screening for all of these conditions that detects the condition and does so without an unacceptable number of what we call false positive specimens, meaning we don't call in an unacceptable number of normal babies for testing in order to make the diagnosis in those infants who are affected. And you can't really say, well, what constitutes an unacceptable number, but we certainly wanna keep the number of false positives as low as possible because it's very anxiety provoking for any parent, obviously, to be called and told that their baby has tested positive for one of the disorders on the newborn screening panel. We need to have treatment for the condition and there needs to be evidence that initiation of treatment prior to clinical diagnosis is beneficial. So for example, if you can just make the diagnosis of a disorder once a child develops symptoms and treat at that point and everything works out fine, then you don't really need newborn screening, right? And, and for one of our lysosomal diseases that's a non-MPS disorder, Gaucher disease, that's one of the big arguments that people use against newborn screening. Now, I happen to be a proponent of newborn screening for that disease too, so, and that's off the topic. We do it in our state, uh, but that's one where we are much more successful with treatment once diagnosis is established than we are with the MPS disorders because you've heard over and over again that these are progressive disorders. We have progressive organ damage over time, and at some point this is irreversible, and prevention of clinical manifestations is much, much easier than reversal once uh, they've come into place. 
Uh, and then the other thing we need to get a disorder added to our newborn screening panels is that we need to have some pilot data and our uh, Secretary's Advisory Committee likes to see some pilot data from the U.S. Uh, showing that screening can be accomplished. They'll consider data from other countries, but we need some data from the U.S. showing that you can detect the condition uh, using the screening methods that are available. Uh, well, that's what we need to see really to make a disorder a good candidate, but why do we want newborn screening? I think we've already kind of answered that question many times over, but I think there, there are multiple reasons why we want it. Uh, one is we'd like to avoid that diagnostic odyssey that's experienced by so many patients and families where you take your child to one doctor after another, or maybe three or four or five different specialists for various problems until finally the whole picture comes together and someone makes a diagnosis, oftentimes months if not years after the child has already had symptoms. Um, and of course, as we've stated over and over again, we want early institution of treatment before permanent irreversible damage occurs. We also want to be able to give appropriate genetic counseling to families. I mean, I, I know many, many times I've made a diagnosis of an MPS disorder in a uh, three or four or five year old child and look to see that there's one or two younger kids in the household uh, who often also turn out to be affected. Uh, and so families haven't had the opportunity to make decisions about family planning because they didn't have a diagnosis in the older child and now they may have two or three affected children before that diagnosis is finally established. So there are a lot of good reasons and I think the MPS disorders as we've heard really meet all the criteria to make them good candidates for newborn screening. Nobody here would argue that they're not serious. Uh, we finally now have tests for really all of them that can be done on dried blood spots. That hasn't always been the case. And you know, we, we know now that we have MPS 1 and 2 newborn screening in place. Those were really the first two disorders for which the the reagents, the chemicals were developed that allowed it to be done on the dried blood spot. We passed legislation in the state of Illinois in 2010 that mandated newborn screening for MPS 1 and 2 before it was ongoing really anywhere else. We would have added MPS 4, 6, and well, not seven, we didn't have a treatment then, but we would have added the other two, but there wasn't a test at that time. Uh, but now there, there are those tests. Mike Gelb and his group have developed the test, really, even now for the last one that was the hardest, the toughest, MPS3A. So the tests are there. Um, and we know we have treatment for a number of these, of course, 4A, 6, and 7, and we have the investigational therapies going on for MPS3. Um, and we have some evidence with some of our disorders that treatment prior to clinical recognition is beneficial. We all know that's true, but that was our biggest hurdle in getting MPS2 newborn screening that the quality of the evidence that we had to show that was just not very good. Uh, part of the reason for that is obvious. Without newborn screening, there's only a limited number of times you have the opportunity to treat somebody before the onset of clinical symptoms and show how much better they can do. So it was largely with sibling pairs you know, that we pulled some of that out, but uh, we had not done a really great job going into this, you know, feeding that data and evidence into the literature. And it's really important because that's a critical point. That's something that really is a focus. Uh, you really have to know that that's true and not just us say it's true, there has to be evidence. Uh, and again, pilot data. So pilot data from the state of Missouri really formed the foundation for the approval of MPS-1 on the RUSP. Well, how did that data come about? I'll tell you how it came about. It came about because in Illinois, we had legislation passed in 2006 mandating newborn screening for five LSDs, the only five for which uh, 
there were tests available at the time. There were no MPS disorders in the group. There was difficulty getting that started. Our health department didn't get it going in the timetable that was required by the legislation. So they asked for more time. And the group of us with a, an important legislator who had spearheaded the initial legislation, we said, well, we'll agree to that with a new piece of legislation, but only by adding MPS 1 and 2 as well. So we had that done. Missouri then followed suit, and in both of those states, that legislation came about because of parent activists working with physicians in those states who went to their representatives and said, we want newborn screening. And it was mandated. Those disorders weren't on the RUSP, uh, and they still wouldn't be on the RUSP if that pilot data hadn't been generated because those states in, in screening their newborns generated the data that provided the basis for addition. And it was the Missouri and Illinois data again that provided the data that really was important in the MPS2 application. So now we have a newborn screening for MPS2. You've heard we've had it for six years. It's now ongoing in many states. Uh, covering about 75% of all U.S. newborns. So that's a huge accomplishment, but of course we need it in 100%, right? And it's taken six years to get here. Uh, so why does it take so long? I think it's a variety of reasons. In some cases, it's how the, the addition of new disorders occurs in a state, if they need a new piece of legislation or if a committee has to authorize it. It's the funding mechanisms. It's just how well that state government works. There are a lot of things that go on. Is there, is there someone really pushing to get this done or is there, you know, is this just sort of, you know, an apathetic state? So lots of different reasons why that, that is the case. Uh, but it's great that we have it, and 75% of our newborns have that, have that tremendous benefit. And there's two primary methods that are in use. We don't need to go into those. Uh, tandem mass spectrometry is used in most of the large birth rate states, but there is a second method, digital microfluidic, based on the fluorometric method that's used in some of the smaller states, and they both work fine. Um, many states now are also using what's called second tier testing for newborn screening, uh, where they first uh, do the testing for enzyme. Both of the primary methods screen by measuring the enzyme activity, iduronidase in the case of MPS1. Um, some states, many now are moving to a second test if the iduronidase activity is low to measure either the amount of GAGs, uh, the substrate that's accumulated in the dried blood spot, or doing gene sequencing. Uh, and this significantly reduces false positives, but there may be some disadvantages as well, and I'll mention that in a moment. So this is a pretty good representation of the current map of where newborn screening for MPS disorders goes on. I don't want to say it's absolutely up to date because, for example, I know in Joe's state of North Carolina, they're doing MPS-1 newborn screening, but it does not appear on their state health department website as yet, so I don't know if they just consider it still pilot screening, and some states do, so I've, I've colored them in only if the state health department website reflects the fact that there's ongoing statewide screening. But you can see most of our East Coast states and the, the big states on the West Coast. The big plum that's not doing it yet is Texas. That's a, that's a very high birth rate state. We need Texas to get on board. Uh, a lot of babies there. And then many of these others are more rural states. So the ones in purple are doing MPS-1 only. And then you have Illinois and Missouri doing MPS-1 and MPS-2. But as you heard, now there are a number of states that have RUSP enabling legislation where once the condition gets on the RUSP, they move forward and that can be fairly rapid in some, some states. So hopefully next year this map will look quite a bit different. And we'll have a lot more states doing MPS2 and even more 
doing MPS1. So what happens after a baby gets a positive newborn screening test for MPS1? Well, first of all, uh, it's important to know that a positive newborn screening test, and this is true for any of the disorders we screen for, it does not mean that the baby has the condition that's being screened for. It simply means that further testing is necessary to determine whether or not the child is affected because there can be other explanations for a positive newborn screening test. Sometimes a carrier will have a positive screening test. And we have a lot of patients who have a condition called pseudodeficiency, and that results in low enzyme activity. And it's, it's a completely benign situation. There's no disease associated with it whatsoever. It's a situation where there's low enzyme activity measured in the test tube in the laboratory but in the patient, there's enough that disease never occurs. So there's no symptoms, it's just not an issue. Um, so if a baby is, has a positive newborn screen, first thing we do is additional testing to see, is it truly MPS1? Is it pseudo deficiency? Uh, could the baby be a carrier? You know, or is this just a normal baby who happened to be at the very low end of enzyme activity? Once we make a diagnosis of MPS1, the next question we ask is, is this a severe form or attenuated? Uh, because our treatment is going to be different if it's the severe hurler uh, form of MPS1 or if it's attenuated MPS1. And usually we can determine that with genotyping for MPS1, fortunately. We get gene testing, and in most but not all cases, we can tell by the specific mutations in that baby if it's going to be severe MPS1 uh, or not. Um, but there are exceptions. There are situations where the genotyping doesn't tell us, and then we have to look to clinical findings, and some additional follow-up may be needed. Now, I mentioned the pseudo-deficiency variants. Uh, those patients never develop findings of MPS. It's a condition that's very, very common in African Americans. So, for example, in Illinois, where we do newborn screening for MPS1 by enzyme activity only, we have no second tier testing. So if there's low enzyme activity, the baby comes to a physician to get diagnostic testing. We diagnose 80 to 100 patients with pseudo deficiency for every one with true MPS1. And that's because we have lots of African American individuals you know, in our state. If you're in a state where that's not the case, then, you know, the situation would be different. Uh, but for us, you know, we have a lot of pseudo deficiency. It's very common. It's not limited to the African American population. We can also see it in Caucasian, Asian infants, really any ethnic group, but it is, there are six variants in the gene that are very, very common in African Americans cause pseudo deficiency. So when we see those variants on genotyping, you know, we've already figured out this is probably pseudo deficiency because those patients not only don't have clinical disease, they don't accumulate glycosaminoglycans. They, they don't have substrate accumulation. So if we have normal urine gags, low enzyme activity, you know, that's presumed pseudo deficiency, but it's very reassuring to see those genetic variants that we know to be associated with pseudo deficiency when we do follow-up testing. Um, in the patients with pseudo deficiency, <coughs> like I mentioned, gags are typically normal. We use urine, but you can do dried blood spot gags. Occasionally, they will have mild elevations of both uh, dermatan and heparan sulfate, but not to the same extent they see in patients with true MPS2. But that's one of the places where you can see a little ambiguity with newborn screening. If, for example, you have a patient who's got low iduronidase activity, maybe one pathogenic disease-causing variant in the gene, one a variant of unknown significance, which could be either disease-causing or could be a pseudo-deficiency variant, 
and they have mild elevations of dermatin, heparin, sulfate, that would be a patient we'd probably follow, do some repeat testing, repeat exams over time. But that's a very small fraction of the patients that we follow up from newborn screening. Most of the time we can definitively figure out early on, do they have it or not? Is it pseudodeficiency? If they have it, what's the phenotype? And move on from there. And if the diagnosis of MPS1 is confirmed uh, using the tests that I've talked about, then of course we do a complete clinical evaluation of the baby. We'd like to know is there any evident disease, and um, that would include things like skeletal x-rays, echocardiography, and so forth, because in the patients with the severe phenotype, even as early as four to six weeks of age, it's not uncommon to see some of the skeletal findings that go along with dysostosis multiplex, some of the findings in the spine particularly and in the ribs, and that helps cement your, your understanding that this indeed is a severe phenotype. And we refer re, uh, those baby, babies immediately for stem cell transplantation. Uh, so of the kids with MPS1 that have been detected in our state since we've started, most of them have been transplanted by three to four months of age. And we know that the age at which transplantation is performed uh, certainly impacts the outcome. Uh, we had data from the transplanters, like Dr. Orchard sitting back there in the back, early on showing that if you transplanted in the first year, the cognitive outcome was better than in the second year. So we believe that the earlier you go, really the better it's going to be in terms of uh, the outcome for those children. And the ones that we've seen thus far certainly are doing very well. If the genotype predicts an attenuated phenotype, uh, then initiation of enzyme replacement therapy is appropriate. And as I mentioned, if you can't be certain about the phenotype, then close clinical follow-up is, is necessary. Uh, so if the urine and dried blood spot gags are negative, you know, a point I want to make is transplants should never, ever, ever be considered. That is not a patient with MPS1. And there's, there is surprisingly some confusion about this out there, and maybe not even all that surprising, but from physicians who are just getting started with newborn screening for MPS1, um, you know, there, there's sometimes some questions about what is this? You know, we have a baby, the gags aren't elevated, but there's two variants in the gene. Well, that doesn't mean the child has MPS1. You know, you have to have substrate accumulation to really be confident of the diagnosis of MPS1. But what about, there are a few exceptions, I will say this, I know of a couple cases in the U.S. where a baby's been diagnosed by newborn screening, has normal gags, dried blood spot and or urine, and a genotype that has previously been seen in a child with attenuated MPS1. Um, those patients obviously need follow-up, and I think it tells us there, there's some possibility that there are going to be some attenuated patients who at birth do not have elevated gags and either dried blood spot or urine. And if we use gags as a second-tier test, we may miss some of them. Um, and I think that is something that I hear a lot of the uh, folks involved in newborn screening saying that they're willing to accept because it's a balancing act between all these false positives with pseudo deficiency. Um, but it is a little worrisome, I think. Uh, so it is just something that I think we need to continue to keep our eyes on moving forward as we're doing more and more, we're detecting more and more cases, we're gonna learn more and more about whether this really does occur or not. And if there is a way around it, if there's something we can look at that's better. For example, there's some more sophisticated assays for gags now, these so-called non-reducing ends assays that may help us uh, really be more definitive if the traditional ones to measure HS and DS uh, 
uh, don't always do it. But I think that's something we'll learn more over time. So just a little caution about uh, the degree of certainty we can feel we have in diagnosis if we are using second tier testing. We're not currently using it. We probably will in our state eventually. So I feel like we're totally on top of every baby we see coming out of screening with uh, low enzyme activity. But to be there, we go through a lot of kids with pseudo deficiency, uh, a lot of them. Okay, so, so what have we learned through all of that uh, with MPS1 newborn screening? Well, one thing we learned is that babies who have the Hurler phenotype, the severe form, they always have elevated gags after a positive newborn screen, usually dramatically elevated, and the majority have a genotype predictive of severe disease. So they're pretty easy to recognize, you know, no problem, I don't think, with them. Uh, and when the genotype is not informative, and I've had a case like this uh, with two novel mutations, but clearly had MPS1 biochemically, clinical findings are often observed really in the first couple of months. If you look closely enough, you, you know, maybe the pediatrician wouldn't notice anything. We wouldn't even notice anything probably, but if we look closely enough x-ray, and really scrutinize the baby carefully, there's things we can see pretty early on. And we know the phenotypic signs occur in the first year. So I feel good about how we're doing with the severe form of MPS1. Uh, and most of our attenuated patients also seem to have elevated gags in urine or dried blood spot. But like I mentioned, that may not be true 100% of the time. So, Something to keep in mind as we think about whether uh, using DBS gags as second tier testing is really the way we want to go. Certainly we need more, more research on how we can most definitively uh, sort out these kids. Okay, so MPS2 newborn screening, our, our history is shorter. We don't have as much experience. It's currently ongoing in, in the two states, of course. It's been ongoing longer in Taiwan, and they're doing it quite a bit in Japan. Uh, but again, likely to change very soon. I mentioned that we have detected eight infants in Illinois thus far. That's in 586,000 baby screen. So that's an incidence of about one in 79,000 births, I think. And one thing that's been real interesting, I, I, Joe might like this, particularly in of those eight babies, three were, we were able to predict had a severe phenotype, four an attenuated phenotype, and one we could not predict the phenotype. Uh, and of those four predicted attenuated, three of them we were only able to figure it out by doing cascade testing of extended family members. And in all three families, we found older, undiagnosed, mildly affected MPS2 cases. An uncle in one family, a great uncle in another one, with minimal clinical manifestations. And so it underscores the importance of family evaluation and testing to help you predict phenotype. I think it also tells us that this mild attenuated MPS2, although these numbers are very small, may be more common you know, than we thought. And we may see this more and more as we are doing more newborn screening. We also see pseudo deficiency for the iduronate 2 sulfatase enzyme with MPS2. Uh, it's pretty common, uh, about one in 11,000 uh, in uh, Illinois. We've got, um, so it's more common than true deficiency, a lot more variable in terms of the different pseudo deficiency alleles, but we have seen about a dozen that are recurrent, have occurred in, you know, anywhere from two to 10 infants. So um, there are recurrent alleles, but there's also just unique alleles that we presume are pseudo deficiency alleles because the enzyme activity is low and the um, and the gags are normal, and so that, that's our assumption, uh, but not restricted to any one racial or ethnic group. Um, so if we confirm the diagnosis of MPS2, again, by you know, deficient enzyme, elevated gags, 
we always do get genotyping. You know, it's, of course, very helpful. This sometimes allows prediction of phenotype, not as often, for sure, as with MPS1. Uh, but again, testing of other family members here can be helpful, whereas that's not normally the case with MPS1. Certainly for patients predicted to have a severe phenotype, we believe treatment should begin right away. Uh, both ERT and HSCT can be considered. Uh, the data supporting the efficacy of transplant for treating the brain in MPS2 are not as strong as they are in MPS1. Um, but if done early, it may provide some benefit. I think we are seeing it done a little bit more often in the U.S. now than we used to, and Paul can probably comment on that. Um, it's been done more in other countries. We have not had a patient coming out of newborn screening who's chosen transplant. Um, and of course, you would not want to offer it to a patient where you couldn't predict the phenotype. Uh, you wouldn't want to do it for an attenuated patient. This would only be for a severe patient and that you're not always going to be able to uh, make that prediction. But certainly both can be considered if you know you are dealing with a severe patient. Uh, and if you have an attenuated phenotype, then I think this is where uh, physician and family uh, discussions go on and some discretion comes into play with regard to the timing of initiation of ERT. I will say that early on, I was all for starting ERT right away in everybody. Um, but my experience with these families with much older, minimally affected family members has changed that somewhat. Um, so I think you really have to look at all the information that you have available to you at the time and, and make what seems like the best decision for that baby. And of course, then we get to the other MPS disorders uh, where we don't have any ongoing large-scale prospective pilots in the U.S. currently. There is testing for MPS 3B, 4A, and 6 going on in Taiwan. And in uh, the New York State Screen Plus program, which is a uh, program with informed consent in selected hospitals in New York where they're uh, doing screening for disorders beyond what's in their uh, newborn state panel. They are gathering some data on MPS 3B, 4A, 6, and 7. Um, it's a little hard to know how long it's going to take for that to be data that's really going to be uh, compelling for, say, a RUSP application because it's a relatively low number of babies per year and for some of these uncommon disorders you may have to go several years before you get the first case but at least that is ongoing and could get a hit and show that screening works and then that would be awesome right uh, there is also mps uh, 6 newborn screening ongoing in brazil in a community that is of particular high risk so it's going on around the world to some extent, but we need more going in the U.S. So what can families do to promote newborn screening? I know Matthew Allen Wood's given a talk about state-by-state -state advocacy after this, so I'm sure he's going to have a lot to say about this. But I would say that uh, if your state is not yet in the process of implementing screening for MPS-1, now six years later, you can find out why not and advocate for the inclusion of MPS-1. And now that we have MPS-2 on the RUSP, you can start making noise about the fact that you want MPS-2 added in your state. I really think that legislators listen to their constituents. And if you are a family and you go and you talk to your own a uh, representative or a senator for your state house, they are going to hear you. They will listen to you much more than they do the professionals. So you can have a tremendous impact. Uh, you may need to do some research. Find out how new disorders are added in your state. What is the mechanism? Is there an advisory committee? If there is, make sure you show up when they have a meeting. These are always open meetings, whether they're in person or um, 
online and you, there's usually some sort of time period where consumers can comment and the public can comment. So, you know, get in there and start commenting and make your voices heard um, and speak up. And if legislation is needed or could get action more quickly, uh, then, you know, through whatever mechanism is there, contact your legislator and schedule, schedule a meeting. I mean, you have a lot of power. You really do. Um, so just to sum it up, newborn screening for MPS1 is becoming widespread. It allows treatment to be initiated at a very early age, really improving the outcome and avoiding the diagnostic odyssey for this disorder. As newborn screening for MPS2 becomes more widespread, the outcome for this disorder is surely going to be significantly improved as well. You put that together with all the new treatments in development and really the future starts to look very bright for our kids. Uh, screening could be done and should be done for all the other MPS disorders, certainly for the treatable ones, and we need to up the pace. As we've heard, the technology is there. So we need to get our data together and, and get moving. And families have been the main impetus for the initiation of screening, really, throughout this whole process. And you can be powerful advocates for moving this forward. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk with you today. I look forward to chatting with uh, many of you in the next couple of days. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Matthew Ellenwood. And Dr. Ellenwood is the National MPS Society Chief Scientific Officer. Uh, he joined us in 2020. Uh, Dr. Ellenwood trained at Colorado State University and then pursued a residency and postdoctoral training in veterinary and medical genetics and gene therapy. And Dr. Ellenwood uh, was at uh, the University, uh, Iowa State University. He spent 16 years there, so we, we got to know him well in all of the research that he did there specifically related to uh, MPS1 and 3B using uh, canine and marine models. And uh, I will turn it over to Dr. Ellenwood. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, this is the first time that I've been able to speak to the society as a, a chief scientific officer. This is a tremendous honor for me, and in, uh, it, it's an extraordinary advancement in my career. I had always been involved in preclinical work, uh, developing therapies in those large animal models like the MPS1 dog that Mark uh, Sands discussed, or uh, I used to work with the six cats when I was at Penn that Paul Harmatz discussed. Uh, when I first came here, I was launched into a new effort, uh, which was the public health aspect of things. This was not new to me. Uh, early on, 22 years ago, when I first went to an NPS meeting, John Hopwood, who was that researcher from Australia that Paul Harmatz discussed, had a mantra. And what we were developing was effective therapy and early diagnosis. And early diagnosis was all about um, uh, newborn screening. And although I had to learn a certain amount of it, when I got here, I wasn't sure whether Terry was saying rust or rusp. And it, it, it was very difficult for me to get that acronym. And while I can say ACHDNC now, I could not for a long time, and it wasn't until I realized that Democratic National Committee was the same as Disorders of Children's and Newborns that I could figure it out a little bit better. Um, we ended up getting the RUSP nomination through, and it, as you know, it was approved by the Secretary on Tuesday, which was great. Uh, I will try to catch us up. Uh, uh, Barbara and all of the others have really uh, set me up well, and I'm going to try and stay, whoops, I'm trying to get this black bar away, but I don't think I'm going to do it. Okay, uh, let's get out of there. Um, so, newborn screening. As Barbara has said, uh, this is a, I need glasses here to figure out where the page down, 
Okay. Uh, this is a federal process in the United States. The feds will say what they think is uh, uh, something that should be screened. It is up to the states who have the mandate to make that a testable disorder. And every state is different in terms of the way they will write their legislation and run their newborn screening programs. Uh, it, the whole process is overseen by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. This is, uh, we, we do talk about some of the frustrations we have with the process. It is incredibly good though. It is very science-based. It is frustratingly slow sometimes. The real reason for that is funding. And you as advocates have something to do with that when you are thinking about going to the Hill and whatnot. If we put the money into the programs, they could move much faster. When it started, the program was 29 diseases grandfathered in. The MPS uh, disorders are really amazing. Two of the seven that have been added since then, MPS disorders. So uh, you as a community uh, and the research and clinical community should be very, very thankful for that process. Only states, as I said, can authorize newborn screening and adoption will follow a state-specific system. Uh, Barbara alluded to this a little bit. Uh, it's determined and governed by each state's legislature, how they authorize state diagnostic labs, and it, it, there is a, it, it, what seems to be impenetrable bureaucracy from, up, uh, uh, from a distance. You've gotta learn what's going on in your state uh, to be an effective advocate, and Every state is different. What is happening in Colorado is not what is happening in Arizona or New Mexico or Delaware. Uh, so as you think about working out there, you just need to dig in. Uh, there are resources available to you, and there are also national resources uh, that are available to you. So because of this process, we have a patchwork um, uh, of adoption of this kind of screening. Uh, uh, Barbara alluded to RUSP alignment legislation. This is legislation that a state can adopt that says, once the feds adopt something onto the RUSP, we will as well. The, that legislation's not all created equal. There is some that is incredibly streamlined, and there is some that gives you a better path to getting a test on board. So there is room for advocacy even in those states where RUSP alignment legislation may exist. One of the great champions for this, and I'll mention them, is Every Life Foundation, uh, the foundation founded by Emil Kakis in between Biomarin and uh, Ultragenics uh, uh, roles there. And they have a great resource, and I have a link for this at the end of the talk. When we talk about RUSP, alignment legislation, and there are now 10 states who've adopted this legislation. There is a gold standard, and it's not because I'm from Arizona that I put up Arizona's, uh, but they did have a really good program, and that states basically, when something comes into the RUSP, the state public health lab, they will adopt it immediately. They figure out what they need in terms of new infrastructure, costs, uh, that are either more employees or more equipment, and then an increase in the charge for newborn screening. They build that into the budget that they give the governor. The governor puts it through. Legislature's taken out of the process. There is no nomination process going through a state advisory board. It's really what's great. If you are advocating for RUSP legislation in your state, look to Arizona as a model if your state allows it. For example, some states like Colorado, you cannot raise taxes unless it goes in front of the voters. So any revenue increases are really difficult to think about. So again, every state's gonna be difficult, or excuse me, different. Some may be more difficult than others. Georgia, I don't put Georgia here as, as a, a bad example. They're just one that I know best. So Georgia, they have the ability, once something is listed on the RUSP, the advisory committee, is able to support it. It's not a requirement, but it, it's suggested that they will go ahead and support it. They can then present it to the legislature and say, we need this money to adopt this test. The legislature still has to approve it. And then they have 18 months to get it up and running after that fiscal approval. So when you add up all these different checks on the process, 
it may still be two or three years, even in a state that has alignment legislation. There is a role for advocacy at those meetings. Barbara said they're public meetings. They will be advertised. I think the one in uh, uh, Georgia is going to be in October. Uh, and there is a role there. And then when it goes to the legislature for funding, there is a role there for advocacy as well. So how has this rollout worked for example, MPS1? So this is a map of MPS1, which was approved in February of 2016. Uh, to give you some context on the lag of this, loronidase approved as a therapy 13 years before. So we need to do better for the other disorders coming down with approved therapies. This is the map you can see. Missouri and Illinois helped contribute to the nomination process as early adopters. And as Barbara mentioned, this adoption was driven by legislature mandates, and those came from advocacy. Uh, so really critical. We saw a really quick uptake for a lot of states with MPS1, driven in 2018, of course, by California as a big state. And then we start to see it sort of slow down. You'll see all those gray squares at the end. That's an estimate of what all the states that have RUSP alignment may contribute over the next couple of years. But that still only gets us to about uh, uh, um, 80%, so 85%. So there's still a very stubborn 12% of the population uh, from various states, mostly Western, mostly rural, where there is no clear path forward based on RUSP alignment or previous testing. So these are states with current RUSP alignment, and these are the percentages of uh, uh, the estimated uh, newborn or population, birth population from those states. To give you some context based on the numbers that Barbara had presented, and based on a birth rate of about four million in the country, for every two percentage points, that's probably equivalent to one MPS1 and one MPS2 child in that state. So when we talk about those percentages, there are real individuals behind these uh, based on estimates. So on average, we can expect almost 40% of the population to roll into MPS2 just because of RUSP alignment. That may not be immediate. We're looking at hopefully three years as a successful target. Texas does not have RUSP alignment, but there is effort for uh, underway there for legislature uh, uh, advocacy for MPS 1 and 2 to be brought on together. That would be a huge boon to us. New York is currently testing for MPS 1. They are keen to start for MPS2, and there are active advocacy efforts in that area, and also to bring them into uh, RUSP alignment, so to speak. So hopefully we can look quickly to those two big states as big wins in terms of the percentage of uh, 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 births that they represent. So operationally, uh, 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 operational alignment legislation New York and Texas, Missouri, Illinois. We're looking at within the next three years, roughly up to 60% of the population being screened for MPS2. But that still leaves a significant group that aren't. So these are the states where they're screening for MPS1, but do not have alignment legislation. And for some of these states, it's going to be an easy addition for them. They may have very proactive approaches and a very uh, uh, proactive legislatures and public health systems. And, and they'll probably roll this out quickly and may not need a huge amount of effort. Uh, states like this could include Massachusetts, Minnesota, Connecticut, etc. But there is still a role for advocacy in these areas where there's no clear path for uh, uh, adoption based on alignment legislation. This state group of states gets to be a little bit more difficult. These are states um, that are not testing and they do not have any alignment. So we need to do advocacy here to get these uh, uh, states testing uh, and preferably also to adopt alignment. 
The cell can be very difficult, though, because many of these states have, are, are very, not very wealthy rural states. They don't have a big birth population, and making the case for this is critical. So if we have families in these states who have this history, can tell this important story with legislatures, it's really a critical uh, approach to get us over uh, uh, the hump, as it were. And I, I can look at this state, and I know that we have families in these states. So I don't want to put any pressure on anybody, but you know who you are, and you can see the list up there. And we're here to help. Two really big resources that are available to you. The Every Life Foundation has a, 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 an effort on RUSP alignment, and getting involved with advocacy through the Every Life Foundation is really critical. There is also a program called New Steps. I put the link in here. Most of the data that I've gotten uh, for this presentation came from New Steps. It will tell you a lot about what other states are doing. Uh, and then it's just your own sleuthing on, in your own state, figuring out how the uh, uh, public health labs run, what the legislature uh, requires, if they require it, and getting out there and working with partners in this area. And I think together we can start to accelerate the adoption. My goal would be to see universal screening in this country f within five years for MPS2, and I think it's achievable. Uh, but we need to think creatively, especially about these smaller states, localities, and territories as well. I know we have time to catch up, so I'm gonna wrap it up there. And I am now also going to be introducing the next session, which is a research uh, uh, advocacy roundtable. We have three extraordinary uh, advocates uh, to have come up and speak with us today. Terry Klein, uh, you know as the uh, president and CEO of the National MPS Society. She is also the mother of uh, a child with ML, so she is a parent advocate, and she had a history with the ISMRD before she came to the society. Melissa Hogan, an MPS2 mother and also a founder of a uh, nonprofit uh, dedicated to Hunter syndrome, and Kara O'Neill, who is a uh, MPS3 parent, founder of a nonprofit uh, uh, as well. Uh, um, uh, in addition to being also the chief scientific officer of that nonprofit as well, Kara is a, a pediatrician. So I would like to ask each of you to introduce yourselves. And let's start with you, Kara. And if you could um, just give us a brief introduction and your road to advocacy and uh, share your inspiration to form uh, your 5013C. Talk about any unmet needs we see. Sure. Thank you, Matthew and Terry, for inviting me to be part of the conversation. And it's just so great to be here with everybody again after a long time. So thank you for that. Um, so Matthew already started um, and <laughs> told you a little bit about me, but um, Kara O'Neill, my husband and I started Care San Filippo Foundation after our daughter's diagnosis. Um, I had worked for about a decade as a pediatrician focused on children with special health care needs. So when my daughter was diagnosed, it just felt like, you know, irony. <laughs> it was just hitting me in the face. Oh, here I am. I've learned a lot about um, what it means to uh, care for people who are going through really difficult things and even some rare diseases, but now I was going to be living the other side. So um, I just want to say I understand it from uh, a variety of perspectives, and um, I think that's something that is important to me to bring to the work I do with the foundation. Um, but my daughter was diagnosed around age three with San Filippo syndrome type A. It's been nearly nine years ago now, um, actually nine years ago last month. Um, I have two beautiful children, uh, a, a healthy son who is three years older than Eliza, and then Eliza, um, you know, like most families, all families <laughs> with San Filippo, um, you get the diagnosis and you know, there's 
little hope and zero options that you're given. And, you know, my husband and I stepped out of that office and there was not a moment when we thought to ourselves, oh, well, okay, I guess this is it. Absolutely not, not for one second. We knew we had to do something about it. We had to be part of the solution. If not for her, for other people. And forgive me for being so emotional. I think it's just being here with you all. Um, you know, um, we started engaging and talking to you know everyone we could in the field. I dug into the literature, you know, having comfort with that as a medical provider already. Um, you know, in discussion, uh, you know, my husband was discussing, you know, any number of things <laughs> with people at conferences and a former NICHD director told him, you know, if you're not pushing the envelope, then you're not doing your job. And that, it, you know, resonated with us then and now. It's always what we're trying to do. Um, so we got started and we knew we probably needed to do things in some different ways. We really wanted to accelerate funding, activity, and um, awareness about this disease to try to do what we could to move things forward. Um, knowing that you know, so much had been done over the years, building things up, creating, laying foundations, and we needed to do our part to really accelerate um, the progress. Please, Melissa. Uh, so I am Melissa Hogan. Um, I have a son who is 15 years old and has MPS2. I also have two other boys that are 16 and 18. Uh, my son was diagnosed when he was two, but before that, uh, he was born and at about a couple hours old, he uh, was in the NICU because uh, he was a high birth weight baby. He was 10 pounds, two ounces. And the nurse turned around and uh, turned around and then turned back around and he was blue. And he had 50% oxygenation and he was vented and um, then had a, um, a lung bleed. And uh, so at that time, he was diagnosed with PPHN, which is uh, persistent pulmonary hypertension of a newborn. And um, we didn't know if he would survive, uh, whether he'd have to go on ECMO. And uh, he was vented for several days and eventually came off, came out of the NICU. And of course I said, you know, how did that happen? <laughs> and um, they're like, you know, it's just one of those things that happens. And I'm like, is he okay? And they're like, no, he's fine. He's fine. And I kept saying, you know, they're like, no, he's fine. So over the next couple years, you know, we ended up with different um, specialist appointments. And I kept, you know, this is kind of strange. No, he's fine. And, um, but then uh, he was diagnosed because my mom saw an episode of the show Mystery Diagnosis mm -hmm. that was about a boy with Hunter syndrome. And um, craziest coincidence ever and um, then she had to do the hard job of telling me and I knew as soon as I googled it that that's what he had um, but that's one of the reasons why newborn screening is such a passion thing of mine because you know we should have known uh, but anyway um, so before he was born I was a healthcare lawyer and uh, did uh, hospital work and different things like that and was a strategy consultant. So then after he was diagnosed, my thought was, well, I'm just going to take these skills and apply them here and, you know, see where that can get us. And, you know, kind of came up with that, okay, how do I save my son plan, plan A and plan B. And, um, and at that time, there actually were uh, two trials that uh, were starting to or looking to start to enroll in Hunter syndrome and only one actually came to fruition at that time but uh, he got into that trial but then you know in talking with other parents it was so um, the criteria were so narrow uh, we really struggled with how the trial was designed 
and the fact that there wasn't additional research going on. Um, and so we started calling lots of researchers and calling anybody that we could find that was on the literature and started tracking that research and figuring out, well, what could we do to move the needle? And um, so, you know, that's a lot of what um, precipitated starting a foundation. And some of that, Kara actually played a role that I don't even know that she knows mm -hmm. because, you know, we were doing a lot of this other stuff, but then when we started to see some of the work that you guys were doing and we're like, you know, there is really promising research out there and it really needs, you know, funding and a kick in the pants. And um, so that's the role that, you know, we looked at trying to play uh, by starting Project for Life. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, it's an honor to be up here with both of you. We've known each other for so long, and I can remember actually the first visit that I had with each of you. And so I've held those visits dear to my heart. Your visit to Durham with Eliza, and me playing on the floor with her while you were talking to Barbara, mm -hmm. and then meeting Case for the first time. Um, but I'm Terry Klein, and I'm the present CEO of the Society, but I'm a mom first. I'm a wife and I'm a mother. And though we hear about Jennifer, I have three other children. And Jennifer was diagnosed with mucolipidosis. She's my youngest. My oldest is 41. My youngest is 30. Jenny um, had more of a, what we refer to as an attenuated track with the super orphan disease of mucolipidosis. And so she has ML3. And we have an ML3, a 2-3, and an ML2, an eye cell disease. And Jenny had a number of illnesses um, as a baby. She had been hospitalized multiple times. She had constant reoccurring ear infections and had a barrel chest that was forming and began walking on her toes when she was three years old. It was my mother who first told me that she thought something was wrong and we need to get this checked out. Let's go to a podiatrist. Let's figure out what this is. Children don't walk on their toes. And, but she ran like the wind. Her brothers couldn't catch her. She swam, she ice skated, she danced. She did these things until she really couldn't do them anymore. And when she was seven years old, they began thinking she had JRA. So we went on this really long diagnostic odyssey of what is wrong with Jenny. And sadly, at the time for my family, it was a very hard time because I had some very traumatic loss close to my family. And we didn't want my mother to find out that Jenny might be sick and I was caring for her and she had ALS. So we're trying to keep everything kind of quiet, trying to figure out this track. They finally thought they had the answers with spondylofisiella dysplasia. So SED nice, that was a radio x-ray diagnosis. And I began going to a support group in Detroit, Michigan, who was a fabulous group of parents where Jenny kind of looked like these kids. She kind of looked like them, but she didn't have it. And the parents began to tell me, she doesn't have this. Because you see, our, our children were born this way. And it seems like Jenny's progressing, and she's progressively getting worse. And so Jenny's had a number of surgeries. And in the process of watching this all unfold, I realized that the world I came from, which was in human resources, and I became a commercial broker after I worked with an engineering company, and started my own company under a large company at uh, Real Estate One in Michigan, um, realized that that just wasn't where I needed to be anymore. And so we made a decision as a family to take a look at what was going on in the disease world of glycoprotein storage diseases, see where the unmet needs were for mucolipidosis, seeing that there really was no research that was happening that was progressing towards a therapy of any kind but we needed to at least raise awareness and we needed to bring the patient community together on a global level. And I'm grateful every day to the friends that I made at ISMRD around the world because I learned really quickly that my family could grow exponentially, not just here in the United States, but around the world. And there's many similarities among the lysosomal storage diseases. And there's many similarities among MPS and the glycoprotein storage diseases that I knew if I could bring the family to Jenny, that Jenny's world could be brighter. And though I, I waited, I wasn't that person that, like Kara, she jumped kind of in. I got the diagnosis and I collapsed. And I collapsed for two years. 
I went to what I call the black hole, and I couldn't get out of it until I could. And when I, when I got out of it, and then I knew that I had this fabulous mother from New Hampshire that just wouldn't let go of talking to me. She'd send me an email every two months. I'm still here. You know, I'm still here for you and your daughter. I'm still here. And somehow, one day, I responded to her. I responded to her, and that response changed my world for Jenny because it allowed me to open up the pathways for Jenny to learn about how to socially accept what was happening to her as a young lady that was giving up dance. And at this time, though, you may see her walking around, she was wheel, wheelchair bound. And she, she was transitioning, but she was wheelchair bound and she couldn't walk at school and so she had wheelchairs and she had scooters till she had surgeries. But the world of MPS and the world of glycoproteins changed Jenny's life today. Her best friends are those among all the different syndromes with MPS and the glycoprotein storage diseases. And I'm grateful every day for, for that exposure and somehow finding the courage. So for all of you that are here, each of us has a different journey. I wasn't unique. I was a person that couldn't accept what was happening. It was too much. And it was groups like this and parents like you all and like Kara and Melissa that really pulled me up and showed me that there was gonna be a way. And I'm here today because